Good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study. Um, a couple minutes late. I think I'm at 7.04, so sorry about that for being a couple of seconds late. Uh, still going to wait for people to join in. Uh, it is a live Bible study where we like to have uh, comments in uh, or yeah, comments in the comment section in Facebook. So uh, please feel free to comment, say hello, say you're here, uh, answer the questions. I'm going to ask a couple of questions as we go through. Uh, to kind of use up some time while people join in, I'm going to read a few more jokes. Uh, well, this is a Christmas one. What did Santa Claus say to Mrs. Claus when he saw a thunderstorm? Looks like reindeer. Oh, hi, Joyce. Joyce is here. Okay, another one. Uh, I invented a car. So I invented a car. That moves only when the driver is silent. It goes without saying. Oh, Gail's here. Hi, Gail. <laughs> oh, we got a few coming in. Uh, let's see. Okay. A burger. A, no, not a burger. A burglar stole all my lamps. I should be upset, but I'm delighted. Still no jokes and no laughter in the room. It's just dead silence in here. I still trust people tell me after that, yeah, I did laugh. There's laughter. So I'm just believing that there's laughter on the other side of my telephones in front of me here. My kids mock me when I say telephone. It's a phone now. It's not a telephone anymore. Hi, Clarks. Clarks are here. Um, okay, what do you call a paper airplane that can't fly? Stationary. <laughs> hey, the locks are here too. I think I'm going to start. Uh, one of the reasons I was kind of a little bit late today was I was kind of scrambling. My uh, little experiment wasn't really working for me earlier, so I had to kind of come up with something new. So I'm going to try something here, and it is relatively untested. So I was kind of putting things together. But I'm hoping to show a point. And so what I'm going to do is I've got a permanent marker here. So I doubt you can see that, but it says permanent. I know it's going to be backwards, but permanent marker. Got a little, whoops, got a little cup here. Well, it's a little tiny bowl. I'm going to draw a little happy face in the bottom of the bowl. Some people might be shocked that I'm drawing on, like, plates and bowls with a permanent marker. But that's what I'm doing. So I'll put that off to the side. So we've got our little bowl with a little tiny face on there. Hopefully that can be seen by everybody. So what I'm going to do is attempt to clean this off. And maybe if you're watching, uh, I'm going to see if, if you can guess. I think you can see here. Uh, maybe you may not. I've got two little cups here. So I'm going to dip my little paper towel in one of them and try to clean off this little face and see what happens. And maybe try to guess and see what liquid is in the cups. So I dip it in the first one here. And it's wet. I mean, you have to trust me, I guess, but it is wet. So I got my little face. I try to clean off the face. Sort of works, but not quite. Still kind of there. Okay. I'm going to get another paper towel. Dip over here. Face is still sort of there. I probably should have waited a little bit longer for the ink to dry. And I wipe that, and it comes right off. No problem. You can kind of see the stain on the, on the paper towel. So what do you think is in the two little cups? One of them sort of worked, and I think the only reason it did work is because the ink was still a little bit wet. If it actually had a chance to dry, if I let it sit for a little bit longer, there's no way uh, the liquid in the blue cup would have actually cleaned off that permanent marker. Uh, but this stuff in this little cup would. It did clean it off. Cleaned it off super easy. I even had to kind of scrub a little bit to get off what I got off with the uh, first liquid. So what are the two liquids? I'll kind of leave it up to that, or leave it up to you. Uh, Gail says household cleaner. Uh, Joyce says eyeglass cleaner. Yeah, possibly. I almost should have brought the bottle over um, just to show you kind of what it was. But it's one of those things that sometimes we don't know what's going to clean one thing or the other. Uh, th I've heard of like little tricks, you know, if you spill something on your carpet, like, uh, you know, some sort of something that stains, you know, you can use sugar or baking powder or some sort of weird mixture and it kind of cleans off the stain. Uh, same thing kind of happens with permanent marker. Uh, there's certain things that you can... Oh, there you go. Tina got it right. Water in the first one, alcohol in the second. Uh, the second one is uh, is actually hand sanitizer. That hand sanitizer that's like liquid that 
smells really bad. You know, I got some of that, and so I was using that. I think it's 80% ethyl alcohol, something like that. Uh, yeah, CLR could be it, but I don't have any of that. But some stuff works, some stuff doesn't. You know, we can try one thing and we'll, you know, scrub all day and it's not going to come off. Uh, but then other stuff, we use the right mixture, the right solution. We scrub and it comes right off. It's no problem. Uh, the one experiment that I was actually trying to mimic was when I used to work at Lens Crafters. Um, we had these markers like this one. This is actually one of the markers we would use. It's a non-permanent marker. Um, very fine tipped. And we use it to mark stuff on the lenses. So we'd have the glasses and we'd mark stuff on there. Um, just for making the glasses. And one thing that just always blew me away is that, you know, we'd use this marker so then we could just take the glasses over to the sink and just run the tap and just wash off the marker and it'd be gone, no problem, everything would be clean. But we had, uh, we had acetone in the lab. We had actually acetone and isopropanol in two little bottles that we'd use to clean stuff off. And with this marker that would wash so easily under the sink, um, if you used acetone and tried to spray it off a lens, it wouldn't even move. Like it was 100% like insoluble with respect to acetone. And it was kind of interesting. I thought it was just fascinating how you can squirt on this like harsh chemical, you know, that's really, this stuff would melt plastic. Like it's a really harsh chemical, but it couldn't clean off a washable, you know, a washable marker. So I thought that was kind of fascinating. And, and I guess the whole scientific concept behind it is if the molecular structure of the two liquids are similar, it'll wash it off. If they're different, then they won't. So acetone had a, a dissimilar, it wasn't the same as the molecular structure as like a water-based thing, so it just didn't wash it off. The water would wash off water. So in chemistry, you would say like dissolves like. So you'd have to use a similar compound to do it. So very similar to the permanent marker, um, water doesn't match what the permanent marker does, so we can't use water to clean off permanent marker. But we can use uh, alcohol, so the ethyl alcohol and hand sanitizer, to use that because it'll break down the solution. So there's some things that work and some things that don't. And so I'm talking about all the science and all this kind of stuff uh, to kind of show a point that certain things will clean certain things, but other things won't. And it's very similar to the way sin and guilt works in our lives. Uh, we miss the mark. Uh, we miss the standard that God sets out for us in the Bible. And we'll make mistakes. And there's certain things that we can maybe try to solve that, and it just won't work. But there's other things that will. So I want to start with a question. Uh, one thing that if I start having a hard time coming up with questions, I just ask people to define stuff because that's a good question. So how would you define guilt? How would you define guilt? You know, if we have guilt because we made mistakes in the past, how would you define that guilt? And I'm kind of looking for two different definitions uh, for guilt because uh, you can think of guilt in at least two different ways. There might be some other ways you can think about it too. But there's two that really pop out in my mind that I think uh, really work, I guess, really apply well to the situation that we have when we miss that mark. Uh, if you go to Romans 3.23, I'm kind of leaving some time here for people to answer how you would define guilt. What are maybe those two different ways that we can define guilt? If you go to Romans 3.23, uh, this is a passage that really shows how we do miss the mark as human beings. God has set out a standard and we stray from that standard. We, we, it's you know, impossible or virtually impossible for us to meet that standard. The only person who has done it has been Jesus. Romans 3.23, short verse, uh, but very clear. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Uh, if we, uh, God has a standard that he has set out, and we have all sinned and we have all fallen short of that standard. It's, it's impossible for us to meet, to do it 100% perfect all the time. You know, we always have those little mistakes that we made. Uh, it could be really small, but that one really small thing makes us miss the mark, so we're no longer perfect. We have fallen short of the glory of God. We have sinned. All people have done it. Uh, Joyce, definition of guilt. She says, when you feel bad about something you've done. So there's the one. That's the one I was looking for. When you feel bad, uh, you feel guilty. You know, you have that feeling where you made a mistake or you did something that you regret. And you say, I shouldn't have done that, or I feel really bad about that. Um, feel really bad about a certain situation or the action you took. Uh, it's kind of funny the way the mind works. Uh, I remember things that I've done like decades ago. And it's like a really tiny, insignificant thing. But I'll still think about it. Like, why did I say that at that certain time? You know, it's kind of a silly thing, but that's something that we do. Uh, Marty says, guilt is a state. And it's a feeling that we have sometimes uh, because of the state. Okay, so 
That's it. Guilt is the state. And we have a feeling because of that state. So maybe if somebody else can comment and say, what is that state? What does he mean by guilt is a state? It's a situation that we're in. It's a place that we are. Uh, it's a position that we're in. Um, and because of that position, we feel that we feel something because of that state we're in. Uh, Tina says a feeling of responsibility for negative occurrence. So yeah, feeling of responsibility for what you've done. You have that guilt. Uh, the other thing I was thinking of, uh, this is again what I think Marty was getting at with guilt as a state. It's simply a fact. Uh, you have a standard, and the fact is that you have committed a breach of conduct, especially violating a law and involving a penalty. You've made a mistake, and you have to suffer the consequences for it, or you will suffer a consequence for it in a certain way. Or may, I guess, may be the right, better term for it. But regardless of you suffering a consequence, you have com committed a breach of conduct. You're guilty. You were not supposed to do something, maybe, or maybe you were supposed to do something, and either you did something bad or you didn't do something good. So you're guilty of that action or inaction. And that's what I think Marty is getting at. Guilt is a state. You're in that state of that position of committing that breach of conduct. And then as a result of that, uh, maybe not exactly at the same time or the different situation or, or whatever, but we can have that state, that position that we're in, that breach of conduct that we've committed. And we can also have a, a feeling of deserving blame for offenses. So we did something wrong and we have that feeling of blame. So have you ever been guilty would be one question. And if you've committed a crime or committed a sin, as we saw in Romans 3.23, yes, we are guilty in that sense. And then the other side of it is, have you ever felt guilty? So maybe you did something that might have even been not really that wrong. Um, but you just feel bad because you did it. You know, something that you did that you just feel bad about. That's a feeling. That's that feeling of responsibility for a negative occurrence, as Tina defined it. So we're going to look in the scripture and see what the Bible says about both of these types of guilt. Uh, in respect to sin, in respect to missing that mark that God has set out for us. So we saw in Romans 3.23 that we're all guilty of missing this mark, uh, not meeting that standard. Uh, we have all committed a breach of conduct, and we are guilty. We all have sinned. We all have missed that mark. And sometimes we can think that we might be able to wash away that guilt through our actions, uh, through maybe earning our way back in. You do one bad deed, so okay, I got to do four or three good deeds to compensate for the one bad deed. Uh, but we're going to see that in the scriptures, that's not the way it works. You know, once you've fallen short, you've fallen short, and that's it. There's nothing you can do to take it back. You can't go back in time and reverse that occurrence that puts you in that state. You are guilty, and there's nothing you can do to change that on your own. Uh, it's just like us, you know, with a permanent marker, and we make a mark on something, we got water, and we're scrubbing away. There's not much good that's going to come from that. We're not going to be able to clean it off ourselves. Uh, it'll be us just rubbing at it you know, fruitlessly. We're, we're not going to be able to do anything with it. It's not going to clean off. Uh, we're in Romans 3, so go ahead a few chapters to Romans 8. This is a passage that shows that according to the Bible, it's only through Jesus that those sins can be washed away, uh, that we can wash away that permanent marker, you know, uh, that, that guilt can be taken care of. So we no longer have that, um, we don't have to pay for that breach of conduct that we did. Uh, Tina says, I think there are people who feel guilty when they are not responsible for whatever they are assuming the guilt for. So yeah, very true. Uh, something that you may not actually be the cause of. You may not have actually committed an offense, but you still feel guilty for it. So you can't have that misunderstanding side of things. Uh, or maybe even you're just uh, taking more responsibility than you actually have in a certain situation. So you feel guilty for a situation when really you have no control over it. So Romans 8, verses 1 and 2. Romans 8, 1 and 2. It says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, have set you free from the law of sin and death. So we've been set free because of what Christ Jesus did for us. When we decide to put Jesus on as our Lord, he pays for those sins. Uh, we have that breach of conduct, and he pays for those sins as if they never occurred. Uh, we have that state of no condemnation. We don't have to pay for those, those mistakes that we've made. So in a sense, that guilt is gone. We no longer have to pay for that. We no longer have that. We're no longer in that state of guiltiness when Jesus 
makes that sacrifice for us. Uh, if you go to Hebrews chapter 10, there's another passage that talks about this idea of Jesus paying for our sins. Uh, and that's one thing to think about too, is, is that Jesus did pay for our sins. He paid for the sins of the entire world when he was crucified on the cross. And our responsibility is only to accept that gift of forgiveness. Uh, some people don't accept it. But it's one of those things where Jesus did pay for all of those sins. So we just have to accept that gift of grace, that gift of forgiveness that he's offered to all people through obedience to him. When we do that, we're no longer going to be guilty for those sins. So Hebrews 10, we'll look at verses 21 and 22. So Hebrews 10, 21 and 22. It says, And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The blood of Jesus cleanses those sins away. Uh, Tina has a comment and says, unfortunately, there are also those who don't feel guilty when they are guilty. Uh, so they've trained their conscience to justify the wrongdoing. And that's, that's very true. Uh, you can get kind of uh, you know, calloused to certain actions and certain things that you might do that are sinful, that are wrong. And you don't even realize it anymore. You have no idea that you're even doing it because it's, it's not entering your mind because you're so used to it. Uh, you can kind of train yourself in that way. Uh, so Hebrews 10, 21 and 22 talks about how we can have our, our conscience cleaned. We can be cleansed from that guilty conscience. That guilt is now washed away through the sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And it's at that point of baptism that we access that forgiveness. We have that, that guilt being paid for, that guilt being cleansed away. So we have that state that we uh, have missed the mark. We accept Jesus on as our Lord and he washes those sins away. But we all know that when we are raised out of the waters of baptism, we're changed into a new person. We've put on Christ. Uh, we're a new creation. Uh, but the battle doesn't stop there. It essentially starts there in a sense. You start working to live that righteous life, but you're going to make mistakes along the way. It's guaranteed to happen. We're still going to miss the mark. So what happens then? Uh, if you go to 1 John 1 and verse 7, so 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7 it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It's a continual thing. You know, as we walk in the light, as we confess our sins to him, as we recognize that we do make mistakes, but we're still dedicated to him, those stumbles along the way are also clean. The blood of Christ purifies us from all sin as we live our lives, uh, dedicated to him. Uh, we stay uh, stay in that state of doing our best in those situations as we make those mistakes, we confess our mistakes, uh, we kind of work through that process of growing and becoming closer and closer to him and closer and closer to uh, his model that he's put out in the New Testament. We are living that life and we are in that state where we continually have that guilt removed. Uh, it's, it's as if we have not committed that breach of contact, uh, conduct with respect to the way God sees us. Uh, that our sins are forgiven through that grace. Again, it's nothing that we can do ourselves. We can't wash that stuff away, but it's only through uh, what Jesus has done for us that it can be washed away. And all we have to do is access that. So this leads to my second question. It says, if we know, so we've seen that if you're dedicated to Christ and you are baptized into him and you put on Christ in that way, you put on your Lord through baptism and you, you dedicate your life to him and to following what is laid out in the New Testament, we know that that guilt can be removed. It's as if we have not committed those sins anymore. Uh, the guilt is gone. So we've kind of taken care of that first definition of guilt where we have a breach of conduct. It's been taken care of now. So if we know that our past transgressions are forgiven, why do we sometimes still feel guilty? So that's the question out there. Why do we still feel guilty when we know that those things are taken care of? We've all made mistakes in the past. And those mistakes that uh, relate to missing the mark with respect to the standards that set out, those things have been taken care of. And God doesn't see that as being a problem anymore because of what Jesus has done for us. So why do we still feel guilty for those things that have done in the past? Uh, Tina says, this is why we need to have a true biblical understanding of right and wrong. Our feelings are not always reliable. We need to rely on the truth. So that's a very good point. Uh, I've mentioned here that these are the things laid out in the scriptures. Uh, and I do understand that I'm not being exhaustive in the full explanation of this. 
Uh, that's something that we have to do. We have to make sure that we study what the Bible says. Uh, don't simply take somebody's word for it as if you may be taking my word for it. Make sure that you look in the Bible and see what it says. Uh, we need to have that true biblical understanding of right and wrong. We have to understand how we can access that gift of salvation that he's offered and paid for for everybody already. Uh, we need to rely on that truth. And that's really up to every individual person to really look in the scriptures and, and see what it says and see what God is saying. So if we know that, we've taken the steps, we're obedient to him, and we know that our past transgressions are forgiven, why do we still feel guilty for those things at times? Uh, I know it happens. I know that's something that does happen. You still make those mistakes. You know that it's not a problem anymore. Maybe even it's with respect to something that you've done with somebody else. Like you've made a mistake or you offended them or you did something that was bad against somebody else. They've even forgiven you. So God's forgiven you. The person's forgiven you. You still feel guilty. You still feel bad about what you've done. Uh, Joyce says our guilt can help remind us to look at, at ourselves and scriptures to ensure we're doing our best. So it can be a, a, a tool of self-evaluation. Our guilt can remind us to not make that mistake again and to look at the scriptures and see how to avoid those mistakes in the future. Uh, Tina says, we feel joy at the forgiveness, but we still know that we did the wrong. So you can recognize that you made the mistake and you feel joy that you had the forgiveness, but you, know, you still know that you did the wrong. It's still kind of in there. We, we, we can't forget those things uh, as easily as maybe God can forget those things. Um, those are the kind of things I was thinking about. Uh, we tend to hang on to those past mistakes. You know, they kind of hang on in our memories and they, I don't know, they pop up. Like for me, it's like when I'm first starting to wake up in the morning in bed, all of a sudden I remember something that happened like 20 years ago and I feel bad about it, you know, and then I wake up and it's kind of gone. I kind of realize that it's kind of silly to think about that anymore. But maybe it's something that was embarrassing that we did in the past. And again, we think about those things. We keep hashing them up in our minds. Uh, maybe we feel bad for hurting somebody else. You did something that really hurt somebody's feelings or hurt them in some way, and you did it, but you still feel really bad about it. Again, God has forgiven you. The person might have forgiven you. It might be put back in your past, but you still feel bad about it. You still feel that guilt. Um, Marty says, sometimes our trust in that saving grace wavers. Uh, you might start thinking, how many times can I make this mistake and God kind of gives up on me? Uh, and the good news is that he's not going to give up on us. You know, as long as we continually do our best and try to be dedicated to him and continually try to put on his qualities, um, he's going to continually forgive us for those mistakes. Uh, he's given us that example of forgiving somebody uh, 70 times 7. You know, essentially they're saying an infinite amount of times. Uh, we are to do that with our brother and sister because that's what he does for us. We can continually make that same mistake as long as we're trying. Again, we don't want to do it willfully knowing that we have that gift of forgiveness. We want to make sure that we do our best to live that righteous life. But when we do stumble, that forgiveness is always there. Uh, yes, Brenda says, sometimes it's the tapes of our past that keep rolling around. Yeah, it's those things, you know, your mind kind of brings this stuff up. It's really strange how that happens. You think it's behind you and then all of a sudden, like say for me, early in the morning when I'm about to wake up, you know, all of a sudden I think about this thing and it's really strange. So if you go to Philippians 3, verses 13 and 14. Now, one other thing I kind of thought of as to why we hang on to that guilt is maybe we have lifelong consequences from our actions and we're constantly reminded of that mistake that we made. Um, it's hard to think of a good example for that, but maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe you got into a car accident because you're driving very badly and you, you damaged yourself, like you, you got a limp from it. You're constantly limping. You're always going to think back to that time that you were driving unsafe and you got into this accident. It'll always remind you of that. We sometimes have these lifelong consequences for the actions that we've taken. And it makes us hard to forget, and it makes it hard for us to move on from those things. It is hard, but we do have to make sure to do our best to move on from those past mistakes. Uh, I think like Joyce mentioned, um, sometimes it's, it's, it can be good to have a little bit of guilt for the things that you've done, because it helps, helps you learn. Uh, if it's just a crippling guilt that's not helping you learn, that's not very helpful. It's not going to be very fruitful. It's not going to help you grow. We do have to move on from those mistakes. And learning from our mistakes is a way to move on, to, to move ahead from these things that have happened. And in Philippians 3, 13 and 14, it's got a very good passage. Again, I've read this passage many times in many lessons. Uh, but it's such a good passage to really show how we should be moving on from these things. So Philippians 3, starting in verse 13. 
It says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. We have all made mistakes and we suffer consequences of those mistakes. And we oftentimes feel guilty for those mistakes. We continually think about those things. Like Brenda says, it's a tape rolling around in your head over and over again about this thing that you've done. But we do have to continually look forward. If we're constantly living in the past, living over those things that we've done over and over again, we're not going to grow. We're not going to be closer and closer to the model that Christ has set out for us in the scriptures. God has removed the actual guilt, the breach of conduct. He's removed that from us if you're dedicated to him. And we have to do our best to let go of that emotional guilt in the sense that it becomes a hindrance to us living our lives and, and a hindrance to us um, doing what God wants us to do. Uh, if we have to make reparations for something that we've done in the past, we have to do that and then move forward. If we have to learn a lesson for what we have done, we have to learn from that and move forward. Uh, we have to forget what is behind in that sense. Again, I, I don't think he's saying... You know, if you make a mistake, just forget it ever happened and don't learn from it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, he's saying that you have to strain towards the goal, strain towards what is ahead, press on to the goal to win the prize. Always try to improve to match that standard that's laid out in the New Testament. And God has blessed us so much by washing away that breach of conduct, that guilt. We no longer have to be concerned about that. And we have to take advantage of that and minimize the emotional guilt. Uh, so we can continue to serve God and continually move forward in our lives and our service to him. Let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your son, especially for giving us that avenue of forgiveness that we all have, that we can all um, accept. Uh, it's, it's something that's been offered to the entire world, to everybody who's existed. And I pray that we can accept this, that we can make sure that we take those steps to look in your word and look to the instructions that you provided to us that we can live that righteous life and can have that uh, guilt removed from us. I pray that we can have the strength to um, move on from the things that we've done. Uh, you've forgiven us, and I pray that you can help us forgive ourselves in those times where we, uh, we may be hanging on to that guilt that we have for those things that we've done in the past. I pray that we can learn from those things and we can move on and we can continually do our best to serve you and to be more and more like the qualities that you've laid out in the New Testament for us. And I thank you so much for giving us your son and giving us your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, be safe, be well, and God bless.